Hi guys, I hope you're all safe and well in this difficult and, and troubling time. Um, I'm based in Amsterdam. You can see behind me it's uh, it's a little bit dark. It's uh, 6 p.m. just after in the evening. And uh, uh, I'll try to keep this interesting and, and entertaining for you as we go through. Um, this is a subject that's really close to my heart. I've been working in this industry for, uh, for a number of years now. And, uh, and certainly competitive and social, and social intelligence. Um, even though they're very similar subjects, I also think that they're very wide and, and very far apart. And uh, I hope I can try to make sense of these subjects as we go through the presentation. So first of all, I wanted to, um, to give you kind of, I guess, a little view into my sort of data journey, both with Digimind and, uh, and where I've been across the, the globe, because it varies in the different things that we do. So when I first started working at, at Digimind in 2010, back in, in France, we uh, had one platform that we provided back then called Digimind Intelligence, and we were working purely with competitive and market intelligence practitioners, um, delivering information into the organization, usually working back then with, uh, with strategy uh, guys, um, R&D guys, salespeople, to, uh, to basically deliver insights to them for them to make faster strategic decisions and, and drive ROI for the business. Um, all of the projects that we worked on back then would have real proper business objectives. So the, the intelligence practitioners would know what they wanted to answer. They would know the questions that they wanted to answer. They would know where the data sat. And, and back then we worked a lot on something called smart data. So smart data was really looking at specific data sets. So we would be looking at maybe competitor websites, newspapers, uh, industry publications, industry websites, uh, paid subscriptions, professional data points like Factiva, LexisNexis, Thomson Reuters, those kind of things. Um, and the, the practitioners, practitioners would know where the information sat, um, but we would help them to deliver that into the organization. As we fast forward three years, I started to, uh, uh, to move up in the organization and I got very lucky to, to earn a move to, uh, to Singapore and open up our, our APAC operation. Um, you can see there the team that I'd built in the, uh, the middle. I'm quite proud of that. And uh, uh, we had some amazing times on yachts and celebrated many successes out there. Um, it was a really exciting time for myself, obviously, personally moving to Asia, but also for the organization because we launched at that moment a tool called Digimind Social. Um, this opened us, opened us up to a different kind of customer base because with Digimind Intelligence, we were working a lot with the, the biggest brands in the world, but B2B organizations. Um, with Digimind Social, we're working, of course, with a lot of consumer brands. Um, so we were working with marketers um, more often than not. And we were also excited by this world of big data. All of a sudden, we started to look a lot at social information. There was vast amount of data that we were collecting. Many of our clients and prospects were saying, give me all the data. I want to collect everything. However, what that came with was, I would say, not a lot of objectives. So back then, marketers were looking for all this information, but perhaps struggling what to really do with it. And quite often, the not projects would end up looking at base metrics like share of voice and maybe a little bit of campaign benchmarking, stuff that is important to do, but I didn't really feel like was driving the strategy of the organization. And somewhere along the line, I started to get a little bit despondent, um, but then probably around about 2016, 2017, we had a bit of a eureka moment because many of our clients, many of our prospects started to talk about consumer insights, started to talk about the way that they would potentially use that data to drive consumer strategies, marketing strategies, product strategies. We started to go back to more our old way of thinking of, uh, of really driving uh, strategy within the organization. And that brings us to 2020 where we are now. And now I'm sitting in Amsterdam, heading up Northern Europe for Digimind. We start to build a new team. Um, so, uh, so there's some of my colleagues. We have our first Dutch colleague there as well. And, uh, and we're very much in this era of proper social intelligence. Now that, that's been branded around for a long time, but, um, but I, I think in, in 2020, we can clearly say that we're in the world of consumer data and, and social intelligence. And this is very much uh, the future of decision-making. Um, I've been really buoyed by this this year, obviously, you know, financial crisis, recessions, um, economic and, and also health crises with, uh, with COVID has, has caused many businesses, many, many issues, and it's, it's been a really tough time. Um, but I've been buoyed by the number of customers and prospects talking to us about the voice of the customer. Most of the brands that we're working with and speaking to at the moment want to understand the voice of the customer. They want to deliver a better customer experience, and, and they're perhaps moving away so much from 
advertising or, or putting so much budget towards advertising, but they're putting more money into research and development and seeing how we can innovate and differentiate our, our various different product offerings. And again, I think that this is the, the future of, of, uh, of marketing strategies. So I kind of broke this down into two sections. So first of all, looking at your marketing staples at the bottom, things like campaign analysis, brand protection, the things that, um, and I don't downplay this because I think every brand across the globe should be looking at brand protection at the moment. And if brands are not looking at their real-time uh, online reputation at the moment, then uh, then they probably need their head screwed on because it's it's one of the most valuable things they can look at. However, if they really want to start driving innovation, we need to be looking at things like trends, competitive intelligence, and consumer insights. Um, one of the coolest things is that social data is the data that never stops growing. We're getting more and more social media users every single day. There's more and more data being created every day. And, uh, and more and more consumers are interacting with brands online, whether it's via polls, via uh, reviews, via social media. Consumers are putting a wealth of data out there for marketers to capitalize on and start driving their business forwards. And really, if you look at these figures, it is very much too risky not to take this data into your, um, not just your, your marketing strategies, but your competitive intelligence strategies um, in 2020. Um, so what we'll do now, we're going to take a quick look at what competitive intelligence actually is. Uh, I come at this really from a traditional competitive intelligence angle and a market research point of view. This is not so much a share of voice stuff that you would uh, typically see on a social listening project. So competitive intelligence is, is basically a process of, of gathering information, adding our insights to it and sharing it with, with the organization so that the organization can make better and faster strategic decisions to drive our businesses forwards. It's also about creating collaborations around the organization, drawing the information out from within the organization so that we can harness the, the intelligence that we already have within our, our business and we can basically create this competitive intelligence mindset. And it, it is very much that. It is a competitive intelligence mindset. And usually it's driven from the top down within an organization. But it's very much around sharing, adding our insights, and collaborating with various different teams. Um, the competitive intelligence process is one that flows across a few different touch points. It's quite simple, quite straightforward, and it's a continuous flow. So first of all, when we collect information, again, from a typical CI point of view, we're usually looking at obviously online data points. We're looking at news. We're looking at um, uh, maybe competitor press release pages, industry pages, uh, paid subscriptions, those kind of things to, to gather this knowledge. We're looking to make sense of that data. So we need to break the information down. We need, we need to, to, to put it into different buckets, if you like, or put it into different boxes so that we can start to understand it. This is really, really important, this phase. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to come in the form of, of lots of metrics and charts. It could just be in, in the form of like almost like news portlets. But we need to break that data down so that we can understand it. We then need to validate it. Here at the, this stage, we can, we can automate a lot of these different steps. But it's important to validate and store away the pieces of information that actually make sense for that particular question or objective that you're trying to answer. If we look at social media, social listening, quite often brands will try to collect everything, but then they get overwhelmed with the data. What we try to do here is focus on the pieces of information that really add value that are going to drive our decisions. Then we look to add our insights to it, the human part that I don't, maybe at some point it will go away, but certainly not in the foreseeable future. Um, we, have to, uh, we have to be able to cast a human eye over this and, and make human assumptions. And then the last stage is, is sharing this information. So of course, we all know that we need to share the right information with the right people at the right time. We need to make this collaborative. We need to entice those uh, those insights out of the uh, uh, the organization. But we also need to share this information in a way and in a format that people can actually digest it and people can use it. A really cool um, use case of that is with one of our clients, Jivaran. So we've been working with these guys for many, many years. Um, they need to, to stay really active and agile on the marketplace, and they always look to, uh, to find um, high potential players, so smaller players on the marketplace that they can acquire in order to, to drive their, their product strategy going forwards. And what they found was that they wanted to accelerate their decision making. So they used our watch lists so that they could share information that was a bit more focused to each of the individual uh, individual teams. So some teams are working on this type of uh, a technology or acquisition. Other teams would be working on a different uh, subject. But that information would get shared 
relevant to them. And we found that using the watch list, they managed to really improve the usage of the, not just the tool, but the data from 300 to 1200 active users in just a few months from implementing the project. And this was a huge success for them because they were able to make much faster uh, strategic decisions um, across the right data sets um, within the different teams, and obviously on a much bigger scale. Now, competitive intelligence also impacts the entire business. Uh, there's lots of different uh, teams and lots of different ways that you can use and, and analyze this information. Of course, competitors is a starting point um, for, for these types of projects, but it's not necessarily about just looking at competitors. It's about looking at what makes you competitive. Um, if we start with competitors, um, here we can see that um, looking at things like recruitment websites can be a great way to see uh, a competitor's uh, strategy. So, for example, you might monitor a website like Indeed and, and see the ads that are putting out. Maybe they're looking to, uh, to recruit a load of engineers for a new factory that they're building, for example, or a new office that they're developing. These can give us ideas for where they're going to go and start to predict the future. We look at risks, certainly at the moment with, uh, with health, health risks and and economical risks, COVID is causing businesses a lot of problems. And, and many, many of our clients are looking to, to understand COVID, understand that, how that impacts their industry, how it impacts their consumers and how they should uh, engage and, and perhaps behave during this, this time period. Of course, we can build in social media and communications as part of this. Again, more from perhaps a, a brand reputation point of view, a brand health point of view. Um, we found on CI projects that regulations, legislation, government legislation sites are great websites to, uh, to, to, to monitor and, and see the latest legislation and updates. Um, there's a lot of red tape that companies do, especially B2B brands these days, and, um, and monitoring these types of websites can, can really help them to, to potentially launch projects more quickly or in a more timely fashion. Looking at sales projects is massively key. I love these types of projects because they're really good for generating ROI and you can physically sort of see the money that's generated from the back of these projects. So here you can look at maybe doing product updates or rather project updates. So when new projects come out and about on the, uh, the field, you can be alerted of those. Um, maybe looking at a competitor watch or a client watch or, or, a, or a prospect watch and giving that information, especially in the B2B world, um, giving that information uh, to the various different uh, sales guys, feeding them relevant information on the projects that they work on so that they have more chances to win those those business and win that business. Um, we could also look at suppliers. Now, this is also important, especially in today's world where companies are looking to cut costs. You can see supplier performance, supplier health, supplier reputation, uh, potentially negotiate down costs, um, potentially start working with them if, uh, if they're, they're not in line with your sort of corporate strategies. But monitoring suppliers is, is another key key aspect of this type of data. And, and nowadays, certainly social data can come into play on that. And that's a, another use case that you can you can put in place within CI for, for social talk, social data. Um, and then finally, we're on to markets and customers and research and innovation, the areas where I really see that we have opportunities to, to really grow our business and, and drive our organizations through, whether it's through our product through technologies that we could potentially invest in, or whether it's through better understanding our market trends and our, our various different customers. This for me is where you can really start to leverage and grow your business very, very quickly. A cool use case of that is with one of our clients, Alstom. So here they look to, uh, to, to basically anticipate various different market trends and uh, innovate uh, uh, right across the, the industry. And, and to do this, they look to, uh, uh, to, to, to look at the, the latest um, uh, trends and the various different technologies out there to, uh, to spot different technologies that are coming up. And here with them, we managed to, uh, to see um, that there was a, a bunch of different high-tech startups specializing in new generation batteries. Um, and they managed to, uh, to invest in this technology faster than any of their competitors so that they could go to market more quickly and, uh, and, and basically drive um, drive uh, market share much more quickly. Here, we're not really looking at social data, to be honest, but we are looking at various industry-specific websites, websites that will give us information around these different technologies. Um, now, what's also core cool about CI is that uh, many, many B2C companies at the moment see that there's lots of opportunities in terms of using social data to enhance customer experience. So it's great that we see nearly two thirds of organizations out there 
seeing the value in this type of data. However, we also see that 81% of those organizations feel that their processes for doing this type of work can be improved. And to be honest, I'm not surprised at those statistics because this type of data is quite new. Um, even the, the volume of data that we, we see now is, is quite new and it, the, the array of various different solutions that marketers have to look at is, is quite new. Um, so it can be quite overwhelming and, and understanding how to break that down is, is key. So the first thing here I would say is that we can go back and look at that CI process um, of understanding the various different um, objectives that we have right through to delivering the information into the organization. That's one way that I would say social intelligence can, can grow. But the second way is really looking at the data and really looking at the way that we break down consumer insights. And that's how we come onto this second part of the presentation. So we know that the world of consumer insights is changing massively. Um, the way that uh, consumer uh, surveys are done is, is changing. Uh, like we saw earlier, the amount of information out there on, on social is, is growing. Now we know that social listening is essential to any customer experience strategy. Um, we know that customer advocacy programs have expanded to social and beyond social, um, especially with various different review sites um, and customers feeling like they trust those reviews just as much as they trust their friends. And I think each and every one of us, when we purchase products now online, we, we look at various different reviews and, uh, and, and they influence the decisions that we, we make for sure. Um, we also see the customer care. Um, this is uh, done much more on a real-time engagement uh, level. And, um, and this is of course done a lot on social, but also across different customer care uh, channels. So if we break down some of the different challenges here, we first of all, we just wanna understand our consumers. We just wanna understand our consumers how they feel, what they want to see. Various different things that we can look at within our consumer opinions or their habits are, first of all, improving our products offering. So we want to see what they're saying about our products um, so that we can uh, uh, basically understand how we can improve those products themselves or, or the services. Um, we want to find new ideas. So these new ideas will help to fuel our, our product strategies and our service strategies as we go forwards. We want to find little gaps in the marketplace. Um, we potentially want to build um, new products. So we want to see customers' expectations in those um, unmet marketplaces or those gaps in the marketplace. And we also potentially want to create consumer profiles. So if we create consumer profiles, um, we can understand the consumer persona a little bit better and, uh, and help to target that consumer a little bit more, more closely and, and understand the consumer a bit, a bit more closely. AXA in, uh, in Singapore have got a really great example of this. So they launched a uh, insurance scheme in, in Singapore, which was uh, called the MediShield Initiative. Now, the problem for them with this particular uh, product was they were a little bit late to market compared to many of the other players out there. So what they decided to do was see exactly what the competitors' um, customers were feeding back and saying about the, their uh, MediShield plan. So they looked at all of those various different reviews. They looked at the social channels. They used very much a smart data approach. They weren't monitoring everything on the web. They were choosing the right data points, but they looked at exactly what those, uh, those comments were, those complaints were, and that gave them ideas to deliver the ultimate product to market so they could fill the gap um, that, was, that was left there from the competitors' plans. And what was amazing was even though they arrived 11 months after the competition in that particular market for the MediShield plan, in just four months, they became the number one policy on the market and, and they gained a nearly 50% uh, share of voice of that particular uh, policy. So that was an amazing use of, of smart data to really drive a product and, and drive return on investment. Um, we can also look at uh, discovering market trends. So this is where we wanna look at data over a long period. Um, we might want to look at new emerging trends. So we might want to look at like big industry topics. For sure, we probably want to look at historical data here. So we don't just want to look back over like the, the last month, but we probably want to look back over the last one, two years. We might be looking at big topics like um, Internet of Things or FinTech or something like that, for example, um, or fashion and trying to collect big volumes of data, but trying to see the trends within those, those volumes. And um, we've got a really cool use case with uh, one of our clients, Diageo, who
who uh, launched a uh, watermelon flavor vodka. And they, they already knew a, a bunch of the different flavors that they wanted to launch. But watermelon was the one that clearly was picking up the most traction. And again, they, they followed that over a number of months. But what they also saw was that it really spiked. I think it was around August that it really started to spike. And then in that month, they saw that actually there was National Watermelon Day. So they coincided the, uh, the, the product campaign and the product launch in line with that month. So they really used that trend of data to launch their product. Um, another cool uh, use case is with one of our, our clients, Lenovo. So they launched an augmented reality uh, helmet. Uh, and it was a game uh, in collabor collaboration with Star Wars. Um, but when they first launched it, many of their, their their customers were talking about it or the community was talking about it as uh, sort of like a child's toy, which was kind of understandable because you've got the helmet, you've got the you've got the lightsaber, and uh, and it didn't really look like a hardcore gamer's game, which was where they were trying to drive that particular product. So what we started to do with them was really understand augmented reality. We started to look at all of the uh, the key uh, magazines and publications that were talking about that subject. We started to look at all of the, the key, uh, key opinion leaders and influencers and what the public was saying around about augmented reality as well. So we were taking a mix of a big data on a big scale across social and a really smart data approach looking at specific publications and key opinion leaders to see the way that those um, influencers were talking to the communities so that they could really position their content and they could really communicate uh, that product to the right audience and really start to, to, to build affinity with that audience. And, and they found that by creating content off the back of that uh, intelligence, they were able to, to grow their awareness and grow their share of voice by, by 40% um, in the augmented reality market. Um, they got a, a better positive uh, sentiment towards the brand, but most importantly, they managed to drive that product as one of the top selling products within augmented reality headsets. And, uh, and that was a really great use case of, of how you can look at trends in a particular industry to, to really drive uh, your product positioning. The third challenge is really mapping out and understanding the customer journey. So trying to bring this data together and, and seeing how we, uh, how we can improve different stages of the, uh, the customer journey. So we can look and, and think about the different stages of the, the customer journey. There could be many different touch points, and I guess this varies for all different organizations. Um, some companies have huge uh, customer journeys. Other clients have very, very small customer journeys. But still, you can map that out and think about the ways that you would say things. You can also look at things like reasons for adoption, adopting products, and, and post-purchase reactions, buying decisions, what drives those buying decisions. And again, seeing how you can potentially start to break that information down so that you can see at which stage of the journey you need to make improvements. And also looking at consumer reviews again, understanding how consumer reviews directly impact um, purchase decisions, um, because we know that that's gonna be one of the, the key things and, and one of the key areas that will help you to, uh, uh, to, to better improve the customer journey. A nice case study here is with one of our clients, Ford. So, they, uh, they look to improve the customer journey across a whole range of different uh, vehicles and, uh, and, uh, and models. They look to break the data down um, and deliver reports internally um, so that they can better improve different parts of the, uh, the buyer journey. Um, but they're looking at various different things around potentially the vehicle or the characteristics or the offers. So it could be around things like price, safety of the vehicle, security, fuel consumption, those kind of things. And within each of those, we can break that information down further to really understand what's important about price, what's important about safety. Again, so we can potentially use that in our product development. Um, it could be around the buying experience. So things like the ordering process, delivery times, financing options. So already you can start to see the ways that you can start to break that information down and start to make sense of the uh, sense of the data and also of course you can start to look at the way that you can communicate with your uh with your customers and and see across the various different channels how they react to that content again to improve that journey um the fourth challenge is to really look at having a clear uh, data methodology so this was one of the challenges that we saw again because of the fact that all of a sudden there was this explosion of information and this explosion of data um, I think marketers were, were looking at this going, well, how do I actually make sense of this information? 
So we tried to create a very simple methodology that was easy for people to understand and also easy for our analysts to understand when they were starting to, certainly at that very starting level, touching point, how they could start to, to break the information down. And we, we did this across trends, known trends, unknown trends, and search trends. And when we looked at known trends, we were looking at generally like really big subjects, like big industries such as fashion, for example. And here we'd generally be looking at um, big data and, uh, and we'd be using keywords to collect that information. Of course, we'd still break it down in, in different tags and so on afterwards, but we would be looking at known trends, things that we, we already knew about our, our industry or our consumers, for example. The next way was to look at unknown trends, and this would be taking the smart data approach. So here we'd be looking at specific consumer profiles, key opinion leaders, industry publications, really insightful smart sets of data that we would monitor. And we wouldn't necessarily um, uh, filter these via keywords. So we would use like innovation graphs, so things like word clouds or tag clouds, um, but we'd pull all of that information in from those publications and we'd analyze everything. It would be a smaller data set, but it would be a much more focused data set. And there we'd be looking to detect the trends because these people would be talking to our communities. They'd be talking to the audiences. And um, and here we, we, we want to understand what those unknown trends are so that potentially we can start to build those into our unknown trends. And then finally, we would look at search trends. So trying to understand the silent majority out there know that there's still more people searching and directly engaging with brands. So this is really important to, to look at search trends, potentially around big industries, companies, products, um, even people. And these really help to validate the trends that you've seen before. So using this methodology of known, unknown and search trends, um, it's a great starting point for organizations when they're looking at big sets of data and trying to understand industry topics and industry trends. And of course, from there, you can keep breaking that data down, looking at things like the customer journey and so on. Um, the fifth challenge here, and this is the final challenge that we look at, and this is around gathering all the sources of information in one place. And again, when we're looking at consumer data points and especially uh, consumer insights, here we're looking a lot at social data. We're looking a lot at review sites, of course but we're also looking at all the other touch points within the organization. So things like uh, customer emails, call centers, uh, chat, maybe messenger, uh, surveys. We're looking to pull all of that information into these tools like Digimind so that you can analyze all of that consumer data all in one place, all at the right time so that you've got that complete holistic view. Um, thank you so much, guys. Do you have any questions?